So the title might be a bit misleading as this is not a status report, it's just the, not the main thing of my talk, but I'll try to talk about some not too obvious details about the implementation that I haven't talked about the year before this year and the year before that. And also say a bit about what we have in the pipeline for in the future. Right. So as Robert said, I work at six, but this project is financed by Ericsson, where I work together with uh, Lars Rasmussen. But enough about those preliminaries. This talk is mainly an introduction to how BeamJIT, the JIT for Erlang, which we've been developing works, and a detailed look at some of the not so obvious parts of its implementation. And the talk is structured like this. I'll start with a background into just-in-time compilation. Then I give a high-level view of BeamJIT before digging deeper into two parts of its implementation, namely the BeamJIT aware optimizations process we do inside LLVM and also our compiler-supported profiling. And then I'll round off with future work and questions at the end. Just-in-time compilation is an optimization technique that is, uh, has been around for more or less since forever. It was the first reference I know about is MacArthur's Lisp paper since 1969. And it's a fairly common implementation technique. All, almost all virtual machine-based languages has it today. There are more JIT implementations, for example, for JavaScript than you can bother shaking a stick at. And just since last year, there have been a number of new ones. And Beam JIT, as our JIT system for Erlang, is called, why do we want it? We already have Beam, and I think we have Costa somewhere in the audience. We have Hype, I should say. Well, pr compared to a head of an ahead, ahead of time compiler such as Hype, a JIT for Erlang will give us a number of increased flexibility in our usage of Erlang. For example, we can do tracing without requiring our system to switch completely to full emulation. We can do cross-module optimization. And our compiled Beam code modules are no longer our platform independent, some, something which is not the case for Hype. Neither do a JIT require or Beam JIT require us to strongly couple our compiled binaries to a particular build of the emulator. And also, being a JIT, it integrates naturally with code, hot code update. So when we started Beam JIT, we set up a number of goals. Well, the first one, which I th think is the most important, uh, that is that we're lazy, so we want to do as little manual work as possible. We also want to preserve the semantics of plain Beam, so if for example, your program crashes and you get the back stack trace, you should get the same stack trace as if you're running purely interpreting. We also want to stay in sync with the Beam, the standard Beam implementation, so when they do things like adding maps, we shouldn't do have to do anything with our JIT implementation, and we want this process to be more or less automatic. And also we want, of course, a native code generator that is state-of-the-art. And our aim is, of course, to eventually beat hype performance-wise, at least in the steady state when we have done our, all of our native code generation. So how can we do that? Well, I already touched it before. We want to automate this process we don't want to have to do any manual work to catch up to the current Beam version. 
and we will also say that we are not really interested in implementing our own native code generator generators. We want to use a off-the-shelf tool for that. And what it looks like when we started was that the tracing JIT compiler was the way to go. And what that is, I'll cover in, I think, two slides. So what do we have to work with then? Well, we have the Beam, the plain standard virtual machine that Erlang runs on. Uh, it's a register machine. It has around 150 instructions. When they added maps, I think they got two or three more. They are at low time specialized into around 450 larger instructions using a peephole optimizer. And this is to cut down on the instruction decoding overhead. Instructions are fairly complex, so they are CISC-like. They can do a lot of things. It, the beam is handwritten in C. Some parts are automatically generated, but most of it is handwritten C. And from a JIT implementer's view, there is a nasty thing is that this uh, instruction set is not concisely defined anywhere. It's defined by the source code. So to be able to do this, the key tools we are using are from the LLVM project. And LLVM is a compiler. They call themselves a compiler infrastructures. It contains a collection of uh, modular and reusable compiler and tool chain tools. And it uses a low level representation to represent the code you want optimized and generated natively native code for. And LLVM comes with a C compiler, which is mostly GCC compatible, called Clang. And a very ni nice thing about Clang is that it's also available as a, as a library. So you can give, lib and that library is called libclang, and you can give it a C module and get back the abstract syntax tree for that C module. And that uh, is a key tool we've been using for implementing and automatic process, doing this automatic processing of the beam, beam implementation, which we need for our uh, JIT implementation. And I said briefly before that our JITing strategy we, we are using is a tracing JIT. And a tracing JIT works by figuring out execution paths in your program, which is most frequently executed. And we do that by, prof by first profiling our, profiling our program to hi find hotspots or hot paths through it. And when we have found such a hot path, we trace the execution flow from that hot pond, that hot spot. And when we have found a good trace, we turn that into native code, and then we run the native code. So this has the benefit of cutting up off many execution paths which never occur in our program. And with that out of the way, now it's time for a high-level view of BeamJIT. And I'm going to be describing some parts of its implementation, the how we do profiling, how we do tracing, how we do native compilation, how we use concurrency to mask some of the overhead incurred by uh, just-in-time compilation. And also at the end, I'll cover some and show us show you the current performance. Briefly, the inner workings of BeamJIT, as it's on a tracing JIT compiler. It 
uses lightweight profiling to detect when we're at a place which is frequently executed. And when we found such a place, we trace the execution flow until we found something that we believe is a representative trace of our program. Then we compile that trace to native code. And when we're then running our native code, we monitor ex execution to see if maybe this trace wasn't good enough and maybe we should try to extend our trace. Internally, BeamJIT consists of four main components. It contains a, a profiling interpreter, which is more or less the standard unmodified beam interpreter, but it has been extended with some parts that are automatically generated and inserted into it by some C preprocessor magic. We have a tracing interpreter, which we use to record the, the, the execution, execution flow. And then we also have a cleanup interpreter, which we use to get back to the profiling interpreter if we abort tracing halfway through a beam instruction. And the reason it's done with these three different interpreters instead of just one where all this functionality is baked into one interpreter is mainly a performance thing because it turns out that if you're merging everything into a single interpreter, our a C compiler finds it very hard to optimize the code. So, for, for, for and that is mainly due to many entry points into this uh, interpreter loop, and that absolutely kills performance. The compiler spills more or less everything onto the stack and never dares to allocate things in registers. So therefore, the somewhat strange multi-interpreter imp implementation. We also have a code generator, which uses LLVM for optimization and native code generation. And it uses a fragment library of small code snippets which are extracted from the profiling interpreter to turn a trace into native code. So that is the internals of BeamJIT. I've said that we are doing lightweight profiling. And we do that with help from the compiler. So we have the compiler identify locations in the program, and we call those in, uh, locations for anchors, which are likely to be the start of sequences of frequently executed beam code. And then the runtime system measures the execution intensity of these anchors. And if the execution intensity is high enough, then we start tracing. And exactly how the compiler finds the anchors is something I'm going to co uh, cover later in this talk. It's one of these not obvious details. So when we find something that's uh, intensely executed, we start tracing. And as I've hinted earlier, tracing uses a separate in interpreter. And during tracing, we record the beam program counter and the identity of each basic block we execute inside our interpreter. And a trace, we consider a trace successful if we reach the anchor we started from, meaning that we have found a loop, or we are scheduled out. And to limit memory consumption, if we're doing multiple passes through a trace, we make sure that we actually follow the already recorded trace. So we can actually say that, uh, and we use this to determine when we have a good enough trace or a representative trace, because when we are just following along the same old path, this trace will stop growing 
So we say that when the, we have passed through this anchor and num n times without the trace growing, then we say that, that this is a representative trace. Now we can start native compilation. And native compilation is done by first gluing together LLVM IR fragments, which we have extracted from our from the beam implementation. And that those fragments, when we glue them together, we insert also guards into the code flow to make sure that we stay, we are staying on this trace we have recorded. If not, we insert a call to this cleanup interpreter that allows us to execute until the next beam instruction boundary and then return to our plain old standard profiling interpreter. And when we have our trace represented as LLVM IR, we hand it off to LLVM's optimizers and it optimizes for us and then it emits native code. And we have one extra optimization, which is not found inside LLVM, which is which encodes beam not beam specific knowledge, and that is one of the other details I'm going to cover later today. A drawback with using LLVM is that it's pretty slow, uh, so it takes a while from the time you have produces the LLVM IR code till until it's optimized and available to run. And we can mask some of that overhead by using concurrency. So we run IR code generation, optimization, and native code emission in a separate thread. And while we are compiling code, we temporarily disable tracing because it's, there is no use in producing a huge backlog of possible traces when we're perhaps compiling the first trace. And yes, so where are we now if we consider BeamJIT's performance? Currently, the, the figures I'm going to show you are just for, for the single core version, so it's not the SMP support. SMP support just started working last week, so I'm not, I'm not showing figures for that. Currently, it's somewhat hit or miss, although there is a lot of more hit than miss performance-wise. Looks like we are almost removing all overhead for instruction decoding, which is good. Uh, for short benchmarks, of course, the tracing and compilation overhead, or mainly tracing overhead, dominates. And we still have some strange discrepancies which we can't explain, but hey, this is a research project. We're working on it. When BeamJIT does good, we the performance looks more like this. So in this graph, there is a bunch of benchmarks. Uh, for each benchmark, there are two bars. The left bar of those two shows synchronous compilation, meaning that, hey, we have a trace, now we compile it. And we stop, to, we stop the world and compile it, and then when we have it ready, we continue. The right bar shows asynchronous compilation when we, say, we find a trace, we Shell, we hand it off to a separate thread for compilation, and then we continue interpreting until the code is available. And we can also see the, the red part. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, what we're showing here is normalized execution time, and execution time is normalized to uh, the execution time of the benchmark running on the unmodified beam. So I've 
value of 1.0 means that we're just as fast as the unmodified system. A value of 0 0.5 means we run in half the time. A value of 2 means we run in twice the time. And what you can see here, at least, that some of them were around 60% runtime of the unmodified system. And if we start trying to figure out what actually happens, it turns out that it's mostly instruction decoding overhead that we're managing to remove. Uh, let's see. You might notice some in some cases where, strangely enough, the asynchronous compilation takes longer time than running the program with synchronous compilation, like this one, the fifth from the right. No, not that one. S that one. And that is one of these discrepancies we can't really explain. We suspect that it is an effect of profiling still going on. Remember, we only stopped tracing when things are compiling. So we might be unlucky in that we are having a program which starts executing. We find a trace, we compile it, and then we go on interpreting, and then we change to another part of the code, and then we have maybe another trace or selected another trace, and that way we pay for the tracing overhead multiple times, and that's why we're actually slower when we should probably, when one, one would think that uh, asynchronous compilation would cut out, cut out the, the compilation overhead. These are what we call the good benchmarks. We have also a bunch of other benchmarks which are really, really bad. And the black bars, then they are outside the scale, so they are truncated. But you see, can see we have things, uh, benchmarks where we're over 10 times as slow, or 10 times slower that than the unmodified system. And if we investigate that, it turns out that most of them are very small, so our overhead for tracing dominates. And you might ask, well, why don't you just increase the size of your benchmarks then? Well, if we start doing that, then we could make the overhead for the compilation arbitrarily large by just increasing, uh, arbitrarily small, but just increasing the size. So we have decided not to do that, mainly to keep ourselves honest. Okay, there you have it. That's binge it in a nutshell. So now to m some of the more interesting implementation details. Uh, LLVM gives us surprisingly good optimizations. And they are state of the art. They are surprisingly good at eliminating redundant tests and things like that. But it they can't, can't help us with a frequently occurring pattern, which is something that f occurs in most airline programs. And I'm going to illustrate that with a hypothetical beam instruction. We have an instruction that takes a register and an immediate value and adds, the, adds that immediate value to the register. And that's it. It will, its implementation looks somewhat like this. It fetches the register index and the immediate, immediate relative the program counter. Then it does the update and then it uh, updates the program counter and then it goes on to the next instruction. If we encounter that instruction in a recorded trace, it will look like something like this. At we have the code for our previous trace entry, we do the loads, then we do the register update, we update our program counter, and then the code for the next uh, 
trace entry caps. But remember, this is airline. The code area is constant. So the program counter always po points to something that's constant. And in the trace, we store the PC values for this particular block of code. And we have guards that check that we are on the trace. And we have, we know the PC on entry to each basic block. So why don't we just do the loads at compile time? So this part will then just become a single thing. Update register, fixed index with a fixed value. And then we even know where the program counter will end up. But remember, if the next instruction looks somewhat like this, then we'll also rem uh, be able to optimize, about, uh, optimize away the program counter update. And this is an optimization. When we implemented this, it turned really was something that increased performance tremendously. Previously, I said that compile the profiling was helped along with the by the compiler. So now it's time to look a bit deeper into that part. First, by describing why we're profiling, then describing how we do it in Beamjit, and then I'm going to show you some examples that show that profiling or deciding where to insert this profiling structure in these anchors is not necessarily as simple as it seems. But first, why do we, do we profile? Well, we want to find frequently executed code and also if we manage to optimize something, if we manage, if we direct our optimization effort at that parts that are most frequently uh, fre most frequently executed, that will of course give us the best bang for the buck. And that is standard JIT thinking. And traditionally, you have considered we have considered inner loops as a good target. They're frequently executed. And the compiler can usually flag uh, loop constructs. And that's it's good because if you have compiler support, then your run can, can be stupid and it doesn't have to be smart enough to figure out what is a loop. And as I so said before, we call the flag locations in the program for anchors. And when we have found our anchors, we at runtime in Beamjit, we maintain a timestamp for each anchor and we measure the intensi execution intensity by incrementing the counter each time where we encounter an anchor that was, was visited recently. Otherwise, we clear it. And when the, the count becomes high enough, then we start uh, tracing. We also, in order to, in some cases, we can find traces which are, or anchors which are, poor places in which to start the trace. So we have a mechanism to blacklist them so we are not bothering starting traces from that location anymore. So I've sidestepped the issue of where to place anchors. I just say that I'll uh, start of loops. Uh, Erlang does not have uh, syntactic looping constructs apart from list comprehensions, but they don't count because they're compiled to uh, Taylor recursive functions or recursive functions. And as someone once said, to iterate this human to recurse divine, we use recursion for our, our looping needs. So, the simplest way to support profiling is to have the compiler insert uh, an anchor at the head of each function. 
But is that enough? Of course, as I ask, it's not. If we look at this example here, we have a stupid way of multiplying by four. And we see that the compiler has inserted an anchor at the head. But how many loops can you see in this code? There are actually two loops here. One first when we're recursing down and building things on the stack. And then when we have bottomed out in the base case and we're doing all these additions. And our tracer will perfectly find uh, an anchor and start tracing when we're building the stack, but when we're, we are collapsing the stack, then it won't trade your tracing at all. So therefore, we have to have the compiler insert an anchor also following each call, which is not in a tail, in a tail position. So it has to be inserted right there after the multiplication or the recursive call. And is that enough? Well, you can probably guess it's not. What about uh, 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 event handlers? Remember that a trace starts at an anchor and ends when we reach the anchor we started from or when we're scheduled out. If we have an event, event handler looking somewhat like this, we stand around waiting for a message. We, when we get the message, we handle it. This is not, this is how you write in an airline, but what it's compiled to is actually somewhat more like this. We have an opcode to wait for the next message. And when that message arrives, we do pattern matching on it and then dispatch to our cases. And if it doesn't match any of those patterns we have, we postpone deliver of that message. So in this case, we would be scheduled out. Then suddenly a message arrives. We're scheduled in. We do the pattern matching. We call, recursively call our handler again. And hey, well here we encounter an anchor, so maybe we are triggering tracing, and then suddenly, and then directly, if there are no messages in the queue, we will be scheduled out. That's not very good, because we're only be able, we'll only be able to natively compile stuff we have a trace for, and this is a very stupid trace. It only contains. Uh, a call for waiting for the me next message. So what should we do then? Well, we have the compiler insert an anchor after each time we receive a message. And then things look much more healthy in that we're scheduled out, waiting for a message to arrive. We are scheduled in, we encounter the first anchor. And then that means that we can start tracing. So then we go on doing the pattern matching, then we call our handler again, and then we're scheduled out. And suddenly we have a nice, nice trace that actually contains the code you want to be ejected. Right. So now for the last couple of minutes in of my talk, I want to cover some of the things we're working on right now and we have planned for the future. The first one is full S&P support. Currently, I said that we're just, the benchmarks I showed were just for the single core version. And for, be, for, for us to be able to run on real world benchmarks, we must get S&P support working. We also want to have a, a much smarter JIT that knows about BIFs, which it doesn't do today. And we also want to do some more beam specific optimizations. So the first one is full S&P support. Currently, our prototype 
only supports profiling and tracing by a single scheduler, although all schedulers can run native code if they're active. Currently, breakpoints and tracing and code update is broken. So that is something we feel that we need in order to be able to run real benchmarks and allow people to actually test this on real things. Uh, currently, we also limit the JIT to the inner interpreter loop. That means we BIFs are opaque to us. And we want to extend our sa the same techniques to also cover BIFs. And that is something we, we are going to need in order to eventually be type. Also, talking about hype, another optimization we feel that is needed is that we want to infer or, or give LVM optimizers some knowledge about the Erlang heap. So for example, we're now building objects on the heap which may be not used. So for example, if you have something looking like this, you have a function that returns a tagged return value, which you almost immediately rip apart because you're only interested in the R part. Nowadays, right now, we are forced to create that tuple on the heap and then do pattern matching. Although our optimizer will be smart enough to see that, hey, this return value, it was created somewhere, it was inserted into this newly created tuple, and then it was immediately ripped out, pattern match out of that tuple. The optimizer is now smart enough to actually use that return value in a register but it's still creating this stuff on the, on the heap. So we want to be able to have the optimizer remove this redundant heap object of, uh, allocation. And that is an optimization that hype does today. But as far as I understand it, it can only do it for module local functions which are not exported. But as we're running, uh, tracing JIT, we should be able to do this for more or less uh, any functions that behaves in this way. And this is also something that's good enough to more, if we get this optimization working, it will deal with more or less all kinds of boxing, unboxing that is performed on the heap. Well, that's all I have for you today. So, questions? Uh, have you tried to compare the benchmarks with a hype? Yes. And uh, until almost very recently, We've been so bad, so it was embarrassing and not very meaningful. But lately, we are at least getting in the same neighborhood for some of our benchmarks. And I should mention that the benchmark we are running on are the hype benchmarking suite. So it's not strange that hype is good on them. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, you mentioned, I think the slide before this one was cross modules. Yeah. How's that going, how would that work with the module, mo module loading? Uh, that is one of the things that are right now broken, but it oh. will work because we're actually tracking modules or, or when we're creating traces, we track the modules they are passing through. So if you do an up, uh, code update and purge mm. code, we can actually uh, uh, evict 
native mm. code that passes through those modules and then we just have to retrace and okay. then produce new code. Okay, so if you reload, you just start, start over again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions? Nope. Well, thank you, and we're waiting. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.